Last week we finished receiving the laws and ordinances of God, but Moses must go up and retrieve the tablets from God Himself and present them to the people. If you'll remember last week, this was God's voice coming off the mountain. He had all the Israelites down there in the, in the valley, and this was His voice speaking to them. They could hear Him across the whole valley. But now Moses has got to go up on the mountain and get the laws and bring them down. And also, all these 613 laws he has to write down. So he is going to come down and write down all these laws that were given to him by God. We will be introduced to a couple of more people that will be prominent in the temple later on. We are about to witness a principle that will define how we interact with God for eternity if we just look. We will have to look more carefully at the information we are given from now on. And I, I wanted to kind of strike that mode that... From now on, whatever we read, we need to look spiritually at it and see the depth of, of what it's teaching us. Uh, Exodus 24, 1. And now he said to Moses, Come up to the Lord, you and Aaron, Nadab and Abihu, and seventy of the elders of Israel and worship from afar. Now, notice here, he's got the seventy elders, and plus he's got uh, Aaron's sons. Nadab and Abihu are his uh, oldest sons. And Moses is supposed to come up too. And he says, worship from afar. So they're, they're going to have to stay. I, I don't know if you remember or not, but there was a fence built around the mountain. And no one could get past that fence or they'd die. Okay. Then there's a slope of the mountain and then God is up on the top of the mountain. So what he is describing is what? A temple. you got the outer court. The slope of the mountain is the holy ground and then the holy of holies at the top. So he is saying stay out in the outer court and worship from afar. Okay. Uh, and Moses alone shall come near the Lord. Moses by himself shall come near the Lord, but they shall not come near, nor shall the people go up with him. So he's still got this standoffish position. That he doesn't want anyone to even get close to him, but he's going to let Moses come up and build an altar closer to him in the outer court. Okay. Uh, God tells Moses and Aaron and his two eldest sons with the 70 elders or judges to come and worship him from afar off. Uh, then God tells Moses it will be only him that will come closer, but the others must remain at the bottom of the mountain. Also, I wanted to point out, if you remember our Genesis study, how many people went into Egypt? It was 70 plus Joseph, his wife, and his two sons. 74. What do we have here? Moses, Aaron, his two eldest sons, and 70 elders. Okay? So, we're going, in, we're going the other way now, and it's the same amount of people. Uh, verse 3. So Moses came and told the people all the words of the Lord had, and all the judgments. And all the people answered with one voice and said, All the words which the Lord has said we will do. So they're more or less getting married to God. This is, I will do what you ask me to do. This is a covenant. They're making a covenant. Now we have to remember that every covenant is a blood covenant. You can't have a covenant without shedding blood. So uh, Abraham was asleep. But... They divided an animal, and God walked in a figure eight pattern in between it, swearing to do what he said he was going to do. So he swore to himself, because you can't swear to anyone higher than God himself. And Abraham was just going to be given this covenant, so Abraham didn't even have to agree. He just did it for him. So this is what being elected is all about. If you're elected, you can't go against God, because he's going to fulfill what he has promised to fulfill. And Moses wrote all the words of the Lord, and he rose early in the morning and built an altar at the foot of the mountain. So the altar's at the foot down by the entrance, okay? And twelve pillars according to the twelve tribes of Israel. So he sets up rocks. You're going to see a lot of places where they set up a rock. They'll have an oblong rock, and they'll set it up on its end. And that's what they call a pillar. Now remember we talked about the pillar of the false gods, and they were obelisks and things like that that they set up. So he's doing the same thing, and these represent the 12 tribes of Israel. So these 12 rocks represent all of the 3 million people out there. 
So Moses told the people what the Lord had said they must do, and, and the people answered and said they will do it. This is a covenant God is making with Israel and is the same as a marriage proposal and people that said, I do. So we have to understand that there's lots and lots of covenants in the Bible. I, I've thought about taking a weekend out and just do covenants one time to show you how many covenants have been made in the Bible. And your marriage is a covenant. And the blood is shed on the wedding night. God made everything. He, th he thought of everything. It's supposed to be. Well, I mean, he designed it. We're the ones that mess it up. So, he designed for your wedding night to be shed blood. That's why, in these days, if a woman didn't shed blood on her wedding night, he could throw her back. It wasn't what, it wasn't what God had planned. So, uh, I'm sure there were people that would cut fingers and stuff, you know, that had to show, they have to show the bloody sheep. They have to show blood the next morning. Or it's not good. For the covenant to become active, there must be shed blood and, and a meal. So there's a meal after the shed blood. Every covenant must be have shed blood to be active. If we remember the covenant God made with Abraham, it was done with God only walking between the cut pieces of meat while Abraham was asleep. This one would have all the participation of both parties. So if you're going to make a covenant, it's like a contract and both parties have to agree. Moses built an altar and put up 12 pillars to stand in for the tribes of Israel. Verse 5. Then he sent young men of the children of Israel who offered burnt offerings and sacrificed peace offerings of oxen to the Lord. And Moses took half of the blood and put it in basins. And half the blood he sprinkled on the altar. And I underlined that on my copy as half the blood was sprinkled on the altar. Now why, why does the blood have to go on the altar? That's God agreeing to the covenant. The blood going on us is us agreeing to the same covenant. So he's got two basins here. There was no priesthood yet, so the young men, the firstborn, were acting for each family, and Moses was acting as a high priest. Uh, they slaughter an ox and catch the blood in two basins. One basin was sprinkled at the altar, which represented God. Now I want you to see that Moses is being typed and shadowed as the high priest. He's the one that's doing the sprinkling and on the altar and all that. <clears throat> Verse 7. Then he took the book of the covenant and read it in hearing of the people. And they said, all that the Lord has said we will do and be obedient. And Moses took the blood and sprinkled it on the people. I underlined on the people. And said, this is the blood of the covenant which the Lord has made with you according to all these words. So I guess you could throw blood on somebody and nobody would know what the covenant is unless you said, this is the covenant we're making. So he read the words to them. Then he took the book of the covenant and read in the hearing of the people. And they all said, all that the Lord has said we will do and be obedient. So Moses read the laws to the people and they agreed with, with the proposal. Then he tells them, this is the blood of the covenant. They had just made and he sprinkled the people with the other basin of blood. He most likely sprinkled the 12 rocks as there wouldn't be enough blood to sprinkle 3 million people. For me, it shows that a stand-in can be represented before God if they can't be there themselves. And I, I kind of was uh, thinking about that a little while that a lot of people, you can stand in for somebody if you need to and pray for them. Some people agree, some people disagree. But he set up 12 rocks and sprinkled the blood on them and that was good enough to sprinkle all the three million people. So look at it any way you want to, but that's what he did. Because they would, they would have took 30,000 oxes to sprinkle all the three million people. <clears throat> Verse 9. Then Moses went up, also Aaron, Nadab, and Abihu, and 70 of the elders of Israel. And they saw the God of Israel, and there was under his feet, as it were, a paved work of sapphire stone, and it was like the very heavens in its clarity. But the nobles of the children of Israel, he did not lay it his hand. So they saw God, and they ate and drank. Now I should have underlined, highlighted, and everything, those two verses. They went up. How did, why? Five minutes ago, they weren't good enough to get past the fence. How did they go up this time? They, they sprinkled in the blood. 
So the blood, when we accept the sacrifice of Jesus, we can go into the throne room of God. Yeah. This was like five minutes after however long it took to sprinkle the blood, they were cleansed enough to cross over and go on to the other side. Now, they're looking at God face to face. How does that happen? I didn't think anyone could look face to face with God. They were in the Spirit. And um, um, Ezekiel, Isaiah 6, 1, John, was it John 4 and 5? He was in the throne room of God. Yes. So these people are looking at God and having a meal with Him, they're in the Spirit. I bet you they hit the ground. They're slain in the Spirit. Yeah. That's just me talking because I can't prove it either way. But how else could you explain this? Because they were they had just crossed over into the into the uh, holy of, not the holy of holies but the holy ground, and they're now they're eating with God. Let's see here. It says. Uh, uh, and they saw God of Israel, and they and there was under His feet were a paved work of sapphire stone. And if you go to Revelation four, you get the exactly that description that He had sapphire stone under His throne, um, and it was like very heavens in His clarity. So there was no uh, this wasn't like some fuzzy, dreamy thing. They saw what they saw. Okay, but on the nobles of the children of Israel, He did not lay His hand. So he they could he could have killed them for coming so close, but they were treated equally with Moses. So when you get sprinkled with the blood, yes. you're in. Yes. Uh, did anyone catch the difference between a few moments ago until now? How were they all able to go up with Moses now? They were all sprinkled with blood now. Before they had no sacrifice to clean them before God, before the Lord. When we accept the sacrifice of Jesus, we are covered by His blood and are now acceptable to be in God's presence. We can now go into the throne room of God, not just wait outside. This was a sign to the Jews that it would take what it would take to become acceptable to God or to draw near Him. Now see, all they saw for thousands of years was uh, animal blood. And they had no idea. They were just doing what they were told to do. And if it was accepted by God, they made it another year. But they needed to know that this was coming from the Messiah was going to come and shed this blood for them so they could get into the throne room of God. See, the only person ever allowed into the, into the Holy of Holies was the high priest. And that was only once a year on atonement. So that's all they saw for thousands of years. They did not know that if they got sprinkled with blood that they could go into the Holy of Holies also. But that was what was coming. That was the promise coming. You know, I'm not a teacher. I'm a preacher. I could preach on that for six weeks of two verses. Right exactly. Yeah. Well, like I said, I get I get emotional sometimes when I see things and read them, and it's like yeah, we was always talking about Moses going up. Yeah. And that part of it. Right. Well, I got the same thing because I didn't I didn't notice the seventy elders and all that, and then I said, you know, man, they they all went up, and then they saw God. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Well, they, I haven't took notice of that. Right. They ate and drank. What is that about? That's fulfilling the covenant. And Jesus said, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you can have no part of me. Yeah. So they were finishing the covenant right there. Even though it was in the spirit realm, because I don't believe that they actually were seeing God. They were seeing him in the spirit. And like I said, you can go to Ezekiel, I think it's 7. Uh, I'm not sure exactly where, but Ezekiel talks about seeing the Lord. And Isaiah, is, I saw him high and lifted up and his train filled the temple. And he goes on and on about the beauty of the temple. But the one that got me was in Revelation where John said, and he, he was on his throne, his hair was white, and fire in his eyes and all this kind of stuff. And emerald, uh, what was it, emerald or sapphire was underneath the throne. So he is seeing the very same thing they saw thousands of years before that in, in Exodus. The same thing. Jesus was the last sacrifice. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, that's what the Jews can't figure out. <laughs> is that, how are they going to get their sins forgiven after the temple's gone? 
Because, see, all this had to be done with an altar and a temple and the Holy of Holies. You know, like I said, the temple is the house of God. So God's in the back. He's in the back room back there. And all this other temple holds God. And we need to think about that. And we're going to get there. And it's probably going to upset you. And, and you we'll had, get there. They had to come in spirit. So our spirit left our body. Because had the body gone, the body would be burned up. Right. So the spirit went. I don't know who's been slain in the spirit and who hasn't. But if you're slain in the spirit, God is ministering to you. Yes. When you're laying there, He is giving you revelation. He is ministering to you. And I believe that He knocked them all down and they went to Him and ate at His table. And I thought about Terry yes. giving his testimony. Yes. The first thing he did, he was the only one at the table. Yes. And he said, man, these glasses are heavy. They were gold, solid gold plates and everything. We're going to get into that next week and it's going to be solid gold. He's talking about the the table that he sat at and he why here you are you just died in a car crash and you go to heaven and you meet with a god and all these people and you sit down and eat yeah that's not why is that the first thing on your mind well, the first thing on god's mind is he wants to have dinner with you this is yeah so this was not just a happy-go-lucky dinner this was completing his covenant. And he is going he said, I won't drink wine with you again until we meet on the wedding day. Jesus did. He said, the next time we drink the cup, it'll be in heaven with me. So the marriage supper of the Lamb is is gonna be a big deal. And that's when we're gonna drink our wine, eat our food. And it's gonna be heavenly food. And it's not gonna be regular food. But this is why we, we think about seeing a big turkey and all these wine glasses and all this kind of stuff. But we need to think about the spirit world and what it's going to be like with billions of people up there all seated at the table. And God's going to feed us. And it's going to complete the covenant that He's made with us. He, if, you, if you accept the, the covenant that Jesus made on the cross at the Last Supper, then you get this meal. It's coming. For real. See, we're taking, we took communion in the spiritual sense. Right. We're going to be face to face with Him, eating yes. and drinking with Him. And remembering Him, what He's done for us. Like I said, this, it gets goosebumpier and goosebumpier <laughs> as you go through it. Okay? Okay. In my opinion, they were in the Spirit and had communion with Jehovah. The covenant needed a meal to be finished. Remember, Jesus told us that unless we ate his flesh and drank his blood, we could have no part of him. Our physical meal will take place in heaven at the marriage feast of the Lamb when we eat together with our husband. But for now, we have communion for a spiritual meal with him. For me, this is the same thing as Ezekiel 1. I thought it was Ezekiel 7, but it's 1. Isaiah 6, Daniel 7, he saw the throne room then, and Revelation 4 and 5. When, we, when men saw God and lived, it almost has to be that they saw God in the Spirit. Remember John said, I was carried away in the Spirit. He says, many times, I don't know if I was awake or in the Spirit. And when Revelation comes, he said, and I was carried away in the Spirit. Yeah. So he knew that he was still on earth, but he was being carried around heaven. Um, John says he was in the spirit and he described heaven and the throne with the sapphire stones exactly as Moses did in Exodus 24. But the key here for me is knowing <clears throat> that they were not allowed, allowed even on the mountain before the sprinkling of blood, blood <clears throat> and then they are eating and drinking in the presence of God after the sprinkling with the blood. In my opinion... God was making a point that because they had been sprinkled with the blood of sacrifice, they could come into His presence and eat and drink. And God did not lay a hand on them. Later on, when the tabernacle is built, God will be seated in the mercy seat, looking down at the tablets of the law and the ark, knowing we have broken laws. I wrote some notes here of my own. God always is in the temple. 
I don't know of any time in the Bible where God wasn't in a temple. Like I said, on this mountain, you can say, well, He was on top of the mountain. That's the Holy of Holies. And when somebody comes close, He says, you're on holy ground. See? So you're, you're in the holy area. There's an outside area that's called holy ground. Okay? Then you've got the, the uh, courtyard. Yes. So no matter where God is, He brings His temple with Him. Right. You know? say wherever God is, Right. Well, that's what I'm saying. He's got an outer court yes. and a courtyard and a, whole, and a holy ground and then the Holy of Holies. Wherever he goes, he is going to have that. So if you come in contact with God, he's going to take, take your shoes off because you're on holy and ground. And we should see that later on with how the temple is designed and how the, the court is and getting the right. labor and all that Absolutely. before you ever get to the yeah. Holy of Holies. And the point I want to make is that Jesus is the temple. Yes. And he is the tabernacle. So when we get there, how how can you have God in the temple? His body is the temple. And or the tabernacle. And God is in inside of him. Yeah. So Jehovah is in Christ. And we're going to get into this in and out and on and onto and that a little later. This is what really got me going. The wall is the courtyard. The mountain slope was holy ground. The uh, top of the mountain is the Holy of Holies. So anywhere you see God there, you need to see this somehow as a marker and a separation and a separation and a separation because all this is there. But he must look through the blood sprinkled on the mercy seat to see the tablets. Now I wanted to draw kind of a mental picture here of God sitting on top of the mercy seat and he's looking down. The mercy seat had blood spread on it, which was Jesus's. Remember, Jesus said, I have not yet gone to my Father. Don't touch me. He had to stay holy, separated from people. So he was going to bring his blood up to the mercy seat and put his blood on the mercy seat. So when Jehovah is looking down, he's going to have to look through that blood to see the Ten Commandments that were broken. So he's going to see those are my laws and y'all broke them. But then there's blood covering on it that paid for it. Yes. So he can't, this is the mercy seat because he's going to give us mercy if we're under the blood. Okay? Now, uh, it is the blood of Jesus Christ that he sprinkled on the mercy seat in heaven that keeps us from judgment even today. Twelve, uh, Verse 12. Then the Lord said to Moses, Come up to me on the mountain and be there and I will give you tablets of stone and the law and the commandments which I have written that I may that you may teach them. Now I wanted to kind of just show you come up to me on the mountain. Not in the mountain, but on the mountain. Okay? Now, so Moses arose with the assistant Joshua. Now what's his name? Yehoshua. Okay? And Moses went up to the mountain of God. So now he's picked Joshua to go with him rather than uh, Aaron, who's his brother. And that was his fellow traveler all this time, but he's picked Joshua to go up the mountain with him. And Yehoshua is the short form of Yeshua. That's the more formal name is Yeshua. Okay. Uh, and he said to the elders, wait here for us until we come back to you Indeed, Aaron and her are with you. If any man has difficulty, let him go to them. So he left Aaron and her, and we already talked about this before. Aaron represents the priesthood, and her represents light. So if you have any trouble, you go to the priest and get some light. What would you say her was? Light. Light? Light. 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 That's the Bible, the Word of God. The light, okay. okay. Uh, Moses was told to come further up the mountain to receive the tablets God had carved in to bring them back to the people. Now Moses chose Joshua to go with him instead of Aaron. Remember back a few chapters when we learned Joshua was actually Yehoshua in Hebrew. And the formal pronunciation would be Yeshua. Yehoshua means Yahweh is salvation. Aaron represents the priestly presence and her represents light. We will need a priest and light to clear up our difficulties back home. Verse 15. Then Moses went up into the mountain. And I underline 
mine into on mine. Now most people read this and they don't see this. This was pointed out to me by the Holy Spirit. Because I said he went into the mountain? Come on. How do you go into the mountain? Unless there was a cave or something. But anyway, I said, well, let's just keep reading and see what happens. And a cloud covered the mountain. Now the glory of the Lord rested on Mount Sinai, and the cloud covered it six days. And on the seventh day, he called to Moses out of the midst of the cloud. So here he is sitting up there for six days waiting for the Lord. The seventh day, he calls him out of the cloud. The sight of the glory of the Lord was like a consuming fire on the top of the mountain in the eyes of the children of Israel. Now, I don't know exactly what Moses saw, but the children of Israel saw it as a consuming fire. We talked about this. I got a picture of a jet engine. Yeah. This is not just like a, a campfire. <clears throat> this is like forced air. It so me like that. Yeah. It, it was like a, a whirlwind of fire. That I think it made noise because it shook the mountain and the lightning and everything that went with it and the thunder. Yeah, I don't think God would be satisfied with just a campfire. I think this was like all the time. And Moses went into it. That's faith. Yes. Okay. So Moses went into the midst of the cloud and went up into the mountain. And I underlined all that. Into the midst of the cloud and up into the mountain. And Moses was on the mountain 40 days and 40 nights. So now 40 is a time of testing and you see that all the time is, is 40 is, is a big test. Rain 40 days and 40 nights. It's also judgment. But Jesus went, went into the wilderness for 40 days and 40 nights and was tempted. So you see the number 40 is like completeness. It's, it puts you through a test and you pass or fail. You know, it's like judgment. Okay? Moses went up the mountain and the glory cloud covered the mountain. God called Moses out of the cloud on the seventh day after spending six days in the cloud. What did he do for six days? It doesn't say, but in my humble opinion, he might have been fasting and praying, preparing for the time he would call him. If you were up there for six days, I imagine you would be contemplating what it's going to be like to meet with God. The sight of the glory of the Lord was like a consuming fire in the sight of the children of Israel. Remember, the fire in the burning bush didn't consume the bush. Moses knew God could kill him, but he entered the fire anyway. <laughs> See, Moses saw the, the burning bush and talked to it, and God gave him jobs to do, and he trusted God and had faith, and he did them. Now he's telling him to walk into this whirlwind of fire up at the top. Would you do that for God? If he said, you're looking at almost certain death. And he said, come near me. Come in here. I think if you heard God in that audible voice say that, I think you would. Well, our eyes, you know, if you're still in the flesh, if you're still carnal. If you're still in the flesh, you might not hear Sometimes that. Think, you know, there's some miscommunication going on. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but I, that just struck me is that he asked him to come into the fire with him. And he walked in. So, I'm kind of like, you know, if I die, I'll be with him. And, that is faith. Yeah, that's, that's faith. faith. That, this is what he's been looking for, is a people of faith. Yes. He's tired of telling people to do things and they don't do it. You know, he wants to test your faith. Okay? Moses knew God could kill him, but he entered the fire anyway. The Israelites would think that Moses would be dead. So they soon lost hope and built an idol of a calf. If you'll remember, if you've read this before, that they're going to think that 40 days and 40 nights he's bound to be dead. And they probably saw him go into the fire. Well, Aaron was even leading that much. Yeah, so... Uh, His own brother didn't lead Right. So if you saw Moses go into the fire, you said, well, that's over. Let's go back to calf worship, you know. So they started immediately thinking that he was not coming back. Okay, for whatever reason, the Holy Spirit called my eyes to the next verse. It says, Moses went into the midst of the cloud, and he went into the mountain. Then it says he was on the mountain 40 days and 40 nights. 
It probably means nothing, but it aided me as to why it used the two pronouns, into and on, for the same thing. The number 40, of course, means judgment or testing. And I looked at this and I said, well, I'm, I'm just putting too much weight on it. But you know, I've taught y'all before that even the punctuation means things. Yeah. So I looked carefully at what he is saying and he said it went into the mountain. But then it says he was on the mountain for 40 days. So they used it on purpose to go into the mountain. Some things started to come to mind when I contemplated the word in. Do we say we are in Christ? Why do Christians say I'm in Christ? Or not, why don't we say I'm with Christ? We say we're in Christ. Yes. Okay. Well, the word says that Christ is in us. Right. But why if, do we say in Christ? Well, if He's in us. We're in Him. Right. We're we're together. We are His body. Yes. Okay. Is the church a building? Or are we the church? See, we we always talk about this in church that we are the church. But we talk about going to church. Well, that's going to church, but we are actually the church. We're bringing the church into a building together. Right. To assemble. Did Jesus say, tear this temple down and I will build it again in three days? So Jesus said, tear this temple down and I will rebuild it in three days. So he is saying, I'm the temple. Yeah. yeah. But what was in the temple? The Holy of Holies, where God is. So he's saying, I am the temple and God is in me. So you need to get this kind of spiritualized and start thinking about that Jesus was a container for God. That was God's house where God lived. Okay? Of course he was speaking of his own body as the temple. Trying to explain my train of thought is very difficult. So I'll use verses to try to make sense of what the Holy Spirit was explaining to me. Romans 15, 4. For whatever things were written before were written for our learning, that we through the patience and comfort of the Scriptures might have hope. So everything, this is going back to what I was saying, I believe even punctuation is trying to teach you something. Anyway, I believe that because he used in and on, that they're not exactly the same. Okay, otherwise, why didn't he say he was he went on the mountain and he stayed there on the mountain for 40 days? So he used in the mountain once and on the mountain the next time. Okay, Hosea 12.10 I have also spoken by the prophets and have multiplied visions. So he gives visions. And I have given symbols, and depending on which version you, or Bible you have, similitudes is in the King James. Types and shadows is my words through the witness of the prophets. So when he is giving you something, he is giving you symbols. Okay? In my opinion, much of what we are thinking in our minds is not what it's like in the kingdom of God. We can't even think of what God is trying to show his people. He says we see through a glass darkly, but we will understand it someday. We are about to embark on the study of the tabernacle, and I believe it is the greatest type and shadow of the scriptures. If we can understand it with the finite, our finite minds, I'm, I'm going to teach it as a type for Christ's body. This could be a type of the church, where Christ is uh, in the church also. <clears throat> and it could be about the Father having a house. But I'm going to teach it as Christ's body as the tabernacle. The teaching of the Ten Commandments just took one chapter, but the tabernacle and the temple takes over 50 chapters in Scripture throughout the Bible. When you're reading the Bible, you're going to find out the, almost the rest of Exodus is about the tabernacle. Almost all of it. Ezekiel is going to have eight chapters on the new temple. Lots of the Bible in Deuteronomy and Numbers is going to be what they had to wear, what sacrifices for what, or what the furniture was, how it was made, the measurements. All of this stuff is going to be covered in all these chapters. But there was only one chapter for the Ten Commandments. Okay? So, I think that he is trying to get something across that there's something important about the temple and the tabernacle. Oh, yeah. And I think that we don't teach it in, in uh, Sunday school. We don't teach it in the church. And it looks to me like at some point you ought to have a sermon on the temple or the tabernacle. 
I've been in a lot of churches, and from what I've learned, they ain't teaching nothing. So that's true. <laughs> well, that's true. But, it, you know, periodically you, you should have a, a, a study yeah. on something about the tabernacle, even if it's a small thing. But to realize that God is painting a picture of Jesus Christ with a building that houses God. You know, we're famous for saying, well, Jesus was fully man and fully God. Well, that means God was inside of him. Okay? And he is teaching here that he was the tabernacle of Jehovah. So, God is in him. Okay? Uh, not on him. In, in him. him. Okay? Ezekiel 40 <clears throat> through 48 speaks of a new temple in the future. The point is there is a huge difference between being in something as opposed to being on something. We will find that the glory of God will abide in the tabernacle. If the tabernacle is Jesus, then God is inside Jesus. The temple isn't God, but it's a container for God. God is spirit and he dwells in the temp tabernacle. We speak of God as three people, but God dwelt in the tabernacle called the name of Jesus. The tabernacle was portraying the temporary dwelling place of God while on earth in the wilderness. Our life is a wilderness compared to what's coming in heaven. I wanted to point this out. What's the difference between a tabernacle and a temple? The temple is permanent. The tabernacle moved with us. So we are a tabernacle here because we're moving. We're not at home. The temple was the permanent place. It says, yes, we're, we're going to be in Him. Well, I can go back to my Ephesians 2 study where yes. it says that God, uh, Jesus went to sit at the right hand of the Father and then it says we are in Him. Yeah. And I think it's 2.9 or something. Ephesians 2.9, I'm not sure which one. But it says we are in Him. Now. Right now. Yeah. Not in the future. So he, he told me, I'm in you yes. and you're in me. Okay, six. And raised us up. Okay, let's start here. Even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ, by grace you have been saved, and raised us up together. Raised is now. That's not going to raise. We're raised right now. Together, and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So we're in Christ Jesus right now. Yes. And people say, well, I'm not dead yet. But something of you is up there. I think it's our spirit that's been resurrected. What died in the garden? Our spirit. Yeah. We have a soul and a body and a dead spirit. When we get resurrected, we have the Holy Spirit in us. Hebrews 9. Now, I'm going to give everybody homework. You go home and read Hebrews 8 and 9, but mainly 9, mm -hmm. because it's all about the temple. And it's very explanatory about what we're talking about tonight. Uh, Hebrews 9.23 Therefore it was necessary that the copies of the things in heavens should be purified with these. So he is saying the copies of the things in heaven. The earthly temple and tabernacle were copies of what he built in heaven without human hands. So it says uh, uh, they should be purified with these, that's blood, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these, which is the blood of Jesus. So that's why Jesus had to go home and take his blood up there and put it on the mercy seat. And sprinkle the altar, too, I imagine. Okay? For Christ has not entered the holy places made with hands, which are copies of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us, not that he should offer himself often as the high priest enters the most holy place every year with blood of another. So he is saying that he's up there once and for all, his blood has been offered, and now he's interceding for us. All of this on earth is just a copy of things in heaven. This is what, when Moses was on the mountain, he was getting blueprints for the tabernacle. He was being told even the dimensions of things and how to make it and everything. I thought, if you read the instructions in, in uh, Exodus, I would hate to be the carpenter that's supposed to build all this because I wouldn't know how he wanted it to look. I believe that Moses was in the Spirit in heaven, having it showed to him. I believe he was looking at the actual temple in heaven 
And he says, oh, yeah, I actually have to make that. I know what, what the... Well, I, I think that, that, like we were talking about a while ago, that the 70 elders saw the throne of God and they ate and drank at the table of God. And I believe what Moses is seeing now, the actual temple in heaven, so that when he gives him the directions on how to build it, he'll know what it looks like. Because if I was trying to get the instruction on how to build a temple, I don't think I could do it just from what's in the scriptures. Mm -hmm. But he had even the measurements down, how many cubits it had to be and all that kind of stuff. Well, probably got the same way Noah did. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. A lot of people doubt the Bible, but they haven't been slain in spirit. Yeah. <laughs> Because God can take care of a lot of stuff when you're with Him. Uh, all of this on earth is just a copy of things in heaven, and we cannot imagine what the heavenly temple looks like. To make our covenant, we had to shed His blood, since it was for the sins of humans. And then He had to go to the temple of heaven to sprinkle His blood on the mercy seat in heaven. Now, if, if a cow sinned against God, then the cow would have to give His blood. But man sinned against God, so he had to make Adam number two, the second Adam, to, to pay for Adam number one's sin. Reading all of the Hebrews chapter 9 will be a good homework assignment to prepare for what's coming in the plans for the tabernacle, keeping in mind that God dwelt in the tabernacle. 2 uh, Corinthians 5.19 That is, that God was in Christ, that's about as plain as you can get. Reconciling the world to himself, not imputing the trespasses to them, and he has committed to us the word of word of reconciliation. So if you realize that if God came down here, we would all burn up. So he put himself into Christ so that he could come be with his people. Yes. That's the tabernacle. That's how the Hebrews got to be with God, was in the tabernacle. Colossians 2.9 For in Him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. I mean, that, that ought to be memorized by most people. That means the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost was all in Christ. So, there, that's God. Jesus was the container of God. And you are complete in Him. And who is the head of all principality and power? In Him you were also circumcised with a circumcision made without hands, by putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. So if you'll remember, go back to Abraham, and the first thing God told him to do is circumcise yourself. Because you're mine. This is going to be a sign from now on. Anyone that is circumcised has the physical attribute of being my people. So when we join Christ... We're getting His circumcision. In Him you were also circumcised with the circumcision made without hands. So no one had to touch your body to yeah. get you circumcised. But by the circumcision of Christ. So being with Christ means you're with the family of God. You're a Jew. You're with Israel. Okay. Buried with Him in baptism. Okay, now Jesus was put in a tomb. We go underwater. So he is saying buried with him in baptism. So he's conflating those two. When you go into the water, you're being put in the tomb and then you rise as a new creature. And see, Mary Magdalene was at the tomb and she didn't even recognize him. She thought he was the gardener. So he was a new man. He had a, had a uh, glorified. glorified body. Okay? With which you were also raised with him through the faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. Hebrews 10, 5. Therefore, when he came into the world, he said, Sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but a body you have prepared for me. So by, by Mary letting the Holy Spirit prepare a body for him, then God took over the body. He came into the body. And we are going to be in Jesus Christ. So we are the body of Christ. The church is. John 1.1 1, 1, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So in the beginning was the Word. So the Word is Jehovah. If you can go back to Genesis 1.1 1, 1, and it talks about God did this, God did that. You look it up and it says Jehovah. That's what it says. So in the beginning was Jehovah, 
and Jehovah was with God, and the Word was God. So Jesus Christ is Jehovah, and vice versa. Okay, Jesus Christ is a body prepared to hold Jehovah. I hope this is making sense because it's kind of weird to think about. And in John 1.14 it says, And the Word, or Jehovah, became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory. The glory is that only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Jesus. Right. The glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So he's saying he looks like the Father. Okay. Now here's the here's the capper right here. Revelation twenty one three. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men. Now why did he why didn't he say, Well, Jesus came down again? It says the tabernacle of God, the God holder, the God tabernacle is with men. So he's going to come down and rule and reign for a thousand years as Jesus. The container of God. Exactly. The tabernacle. Exactly. Oh, now you're thinking like yeah, I'm thinking. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> and he will dwell with them. And I think that word dwell means tabernacle. Yeah. And they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God. So if you read the Bible and underline every time it says and they will be my people and I will be their God or I will be their God and they will be my people. He says it different ways. But there's about 50 entrances in the Bible about and I will be their God and they will be my people. That's what all this is about. So this is the end result. And I love that when it says, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men. And He will dwell with them. So God is going to live with us. And he shall be, and we shall, they shall be his people, and himself will be with them and be their God. This is the climax of all time, when the tabernacle of God lives with his people. It will be harkened back to the Garden of Eden and God walking and talking with his people. God is house, housed in the tabernacle, and you can't see God without the tabernacle. So we will see the glorified body of Jesus. But God dwells in Him. Being in Christ is where we want to be. If we die before we are raptured, we need to die in Christ. I hope everybody gets that because what I'm saying here is that it says in the Bible clearly that Jehovah is Spirit. Yes. So you need a container to hold the Spirit. Yes. And that's Jesus Christ. So that when we see Jesus, we will see eye to eye, face to face oh, wow. with Jesus. Okay? Awesome. Next week, we'll start hearing about the tabernacle even before Moses comes off the mountain. So, he's going to get instructions on how to build everything. And before we get to building, he'll tell Moses what to do.